<laughs> uh, hopefully that countdown worked. I think it's uh, working right. Gives me a second to catch up. I was uh, nah, disorganized a bit. Not as organized as I'd like to be. But nonetheless, now live, we are here. Vlog Thursday, number 325. And uh, okay, the countdown did work. Awesome. Um, the first thing I'm going to mention is sharing my screen here to present share screen Chrome tab. Uh, MSP Geek Con. Uh, we are 44 days away. I've been doing this thing where I talk about where I'm going to be. So I thought this is really relevant. Uh, these are a bunch of good people I know, and this is a fun thing. They got their whole agenda posted and everything else. Uh, this is going to be, if you are able to make it to Florida on May 21st and through the 23rd of 2023, there is a lot to do there. It's very tech focused. It's not vendor led. I want to be very clear on that. And one of the reasons I think it's uh, a good conference to go to, because a lot of these conferences you may be familiar with uh, are very vendor centric and you get there to get sales pitched too much. And this is not that because those are uh, definitely things I don't like is too much uh, sales pitching. So in, there's at least a few people you might recognize. Uh, one person in particular, this guy here, um, John Hammond. And John Hammond is uh, among the speakers there. So that's, uh, you know, another reason to go if you're a John Hammond fan. I'm a John Hammond fan. He does some great videos. But nonetheless, a lot of other good people there speaking. Uh, a lot of information on their site for the full agenda. I just want to give them a shout out. And I'll probably continue doing this for a little while. Uh, you know, just because there might be a few of you that are interested in coming. Um, it's, uh, you got 44 days to get that figured out. <laughs> and uh, if you work for somewhere... They, your employer should be able to, you know, this is a good reason for employers to do it as well. So I thought I'd bring this up again. All right. Ooh, sunny afternoon in Florida. It's a sunny afternoon here, but it's a cold one here. <clears throat> it's a morning in New Zealand. Yep. Hello from the Netherlands. We'll go with that. All right. Uh... So what about the oh, AMD Steam Accelerator? I don't. Stream Accelerator. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't really looked at it. I see people posting about it. Um, yeah. Not really sure. Any easy way to mount NTFS USB in TrueDAS? I haven't tried, uh, so I don't know. I never try doing that. I never plug USB drives into my TrueNAS, so it's not something I have an answer for. So I don't know how easy or how difficult it is. Hello from Miami. How do you configure PFSense uh, for Comcast Business DCP? Uh, clean and clean this all for WAN for five minutes. I don't know what that question means. Uh, generally, it works. You can use Comcast Business with DHCP and PFSense. I don't know of anything special that you have to do. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't really have an answer for that. Um, let's read, though, some of the people who have questions, not just here. I at least have... Um, well, one of the questions that came up, and I need to do an updated video on this. The... Uh, someone emailed a question in about how you handle uh, PFSense. As a matter of fact, let's pull up by PFSense. I should probably pull that up for, but it's PFSense and certificate management for Let's Encrypt. And I really recommend using DNS more than anything else because uh, that's the DNS or an API key. Either one of those are options to do it so you don't have um, some of the silly problems. So share this tab instead, and we'll, uh... oh, crap. Do I got a current generator? Can I short term both add? Oh, I think I got to create an account key in order for it to work. Oh, there's actually a few of them in here. Oh, neat. There's actually Google. I didn't realize Google had one in here. But nonetheless, you can use Let's Encrypt, very popular. Uh, Google, pretty cool. They have those in here too. Um, but these are uh, different ways you can 
start the ACME process on that back end. Then you have the certificate and the general settings. You know, well, let's call it the PFSense documentation. But if you're going to do this, just don't try to do it with the um, the DNS verification. Also, someone had asked if I knew how to do it with Cloudflare. I've never tried mixing Cloudflare tunnels with uh, Let's Encrypt. I, I'm not sure because uh, someone's trying to get that to work with HA proxy. I got no guarantees that I can um, offer any help with that. <laughs> Let's encrypt. But they have good documentation on how to do it in the package settings and what's supported. They have a lot of good support in here, but you really have to, uh, even right here, their tips say DNS update mode methods are best practice. They do not require external inbound access. They can be used in internal systems that do allow uh, or cannot connect to the internet. So this is one of the reasons I just say use this and it'll save you a lot of headaches. It just works better. So that's uh, definitely good advice for anyone trying to get this set up. Just use the DNS when you set it up. And I'll do some new videos on it because I think there's probably some confusion on it. And the other funny thing is people don't like how long some of the HA proxy videos I did are. I'm like, there's a lot of details to setting up reverse proxies and certificates. So what I'm going to do, though, is break them out to a certificate video about certificates and then a video about HA proxy. So that way you can just come in for the HA proxy but reference the certificate video because maybe you already have your certificate set up. Um, another question that came in was recommendations on cable modems. I don't really have any uh, recommendation for them. I usually just get them from the uh, cable provider because it can be a headache dealing with the cable provider when you're using another third party one. But, but I will tell you which ones we've ordered. Uh, we have in the past, I think, ordered some. Which ones did we get? Um, oh, I, I didn't even know we ordered one of these. So I think uh, Steve is Steve's um, off, but he's used uh, one of these Eris ones. So people looking for cable homes, this is the one that I think he's got right now. Is this one? I see we ordered it, and I'm pretty sure we ordered. He ordered it for him. So, <laughs> um, let's see. Warm, cloudy, and Fiji. Click the like button. Yes, click the like button. Um, I'm starting an IT service company. Will there be any talks in about the business sessions uh, about it? Well, let's look at it. I think there's probably at least a few talks that are related to that. Um, let's go for the full agenda here. I definitely know. Um, let's see. So day one, here's your um, how killer service can beat killer sales. Uh, so, yes, there's definitely some business related talks there. Core lunch, vendor hall, track sessions. Let me go down here. Critical thinking by Kyle Hanselvan. Uh, defensive security, cognitive bias. Kelvin is awesome. If you don't know him from Cyber Drain, uh, all these are great speakers. Um, roadmap to career growth, people process automation. So translating MSP business model to the technical mind. This is probably a good business talk because this is something MSP people do not always do is understand how to put that together. So there's by the way, you're going to be surrounded by other MSP business owners. So I would definitely say it's a good place to be if you're thinking about starting an MSP business. Uh, the human side of technology, people process automation, automating operations, human vulnerability management, uh, polling, uh, considered harmful web, ooh, web hooks for PSA automation. So yeah, there's, there's enough in there that I think if you're uh, in the business side of things, you'll still find a lot of good things. Can you use that for Comcast Business? Probably not. Uh, coming back to the cable modem question, Comcast Business, in last I checked, will not let you choose your own cable modem. So you're stuck with what Comcast offers you. They, they just don't have another option. Um, I think you can use it in circumstances if you have single IP, but I know uh, we've had customers want to do it, and they said you have multiple IPs. You cannot do it with multiple IPs in Comcast. That's the last I heard.
Thank you for the separated Let's Encrypts. Uh, yeah, we're just going to do those as separate videos is probably how we'll do that in the future. So that'll probably be the easiest way to handle it. Um, the other thing I'm working on, <clears throat> what else I have in my list here? I didn't even look at the whole thing. Tech Talk, Security, and Live. Yeah, I left the generic because I figured I'd just babble on about everything today. Um, <clears throat> single IP can confirm. All right. So now yeah, that's the important part. Single IP. Give them login creds so you can make district changes. Uh, oh, interesting. If they give them the login creds. Mm. Eh, whatever. Ain't a big deal. Not... It's Comcast. If they wanted to do something, they could do something. Login credits won't change that. But what I'm working on now, um, any tips on grounding and bonding? Uh, not really. I'm not I'm not an expert at that. I have people that are experts, but I don't ground and bond things. It's not me. Oh, Huntress Hands-On Hacking Training Lab is sold out. Well, that isn't even surprising. <laughs> So the uh, I the the hunter stuff is really good. They put on a great uh, thing. By the way, they also have a game room. So there's a game room sponsor. So there's there's other you can still you can still learn a lot. You can still talk to some of the, the hunters. People are going to be there um, all the days. So not not a big. I mean I. Better if you could attend the conference, uh, all the kind of stuff. But I think Huntress has a lot of stuff that you can watch as a webinar or two. So there's other ways to engage with some of that content. But uh, back to what I'm working on, if anyone cares. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, I'm doing a new video on how... Can I do a present on this? Will that work? Oh, you know what? I think I can link it. If I hit present... Slides, Google slide, add Google slide. Allow, hit the allow this each time, I think. Neat. I think this will work. It's processing. Magic. Now, what I was going to do, and I'm not going to do it right now, but um, that little spot is where my head will be. So that's why it looks like that. But I'm going to do some uh, a new video to break down how Zen Orchestra processes backups and uh, some of the features. It's, it's only I'm going to have like six or seven slides. Then I'm going to go hands on with it. <clears throat> um, I, I want to make sure there's a clarification on how a few things work with Zen Orchestra and the way their backups work. They've made a lot of changes since I did my video a while ago and they've made it pretty amazing. And uh, because of that, I want to make sure I've got it well covered in terms of all the functionality uh, that they offer currently. So that's why I'm going to be working on a new video uh, specifically about that in our lab and showing all the um, ways this system works. I have a whole backup testing uh, demo that I'll be sharing, walking through all the steps and everything else, and you know how the backups work, and including I'll go backup uh, overview. Whoops. This is one of the things that they added since I last did my video was the health check in there, so you can know that the uh, VM has gone through a backup. It restores the VM. It performs a health check to make sure the VM boots. Once the VM boots up, it destroys the VM and uh, shuts it all down. So it's like you can do the full everything integrated right into the backups in here. And it's just kind of cool to be able to do all that. Um, am I running 7.2 beta on Synology? I am not. The uh, Synology betas, I, I should, but I usually just wait till they come out. <laughs> um I don't know. We do have one system in in the office. We could just convert over to it. Uh, not sure uh, what is up. Even clean install drops in that in that time frame. Thought it was the MTU WAN gateway monitoring, IPv6, DCP, PyQ shorter. Yeah, I don't know. 
post in forums, post in the PF Sense forums. So, because um, maybe I don't know if you posted in my forums, the PF Sense forums is a better place to ask some of those questions. A white label service like Dropbox, I don't know any white label ones. Um, also, why are you looking for a white label one? I don't understand. I have a slash 29 ISP modem supported, uh, but did dare say not support IPv6 routing. Uh, left all up to me. All right. If you have two internet connections with PFSense, can you have the failover internet service between two providers reestablish S2S site-to-site -site VPN connections? Um, yeah, if you configure it properly, it will. So it can be done. I'll just, I, I don't have time to explain it in a live show, but yes, it can be done. Uh, matter of fact, it works well with WireGuard, if I'm not mistaken. Um, WireGuard has no problem doing it. You know what, Travis? Go ahead and update that one to 7.2. Let's get it on the latest version so we are ahead of the curve doing the testing. <laughs> Why not? Can you cover minimum disk space name for the host when backing up? I have issues where low disk space and the snapshots won't merge when backing up. Um, you, If you have something thick provisioned, you're going to have a bad time. You really should be using something thin provisioned or have a lot of space. Those are your two options. Because if something's thick provisioned, it starts, you know, each snapshot's going to accumulate a lot of space on there. So the answer is thin provisioning or have lots of space. So that's the, that's kind of the answer for that. I don't, I don't have an easier one. I've seen a lot of people break things by doing that. Um, Cause they just, they are limited on space. They start taking lots of snapshots of VMs or they keep too many snapshots. And if it's not thin provisioned, for example, iSCSI, um, you're going to use a lot more space. Matter of fact, um, we look at where is it like this isn't look how much bigger this is because it's not thin provision so i don't have snapshots if i start taking snapshots of these things yeah right here each one's going to take up that uh full space on this base copy kelly tom kelly tom yeah they're <clears throat> i just i have one ice because i like testing it but most all my stuff is on nfs because it's thin provisioned so Uh, planning to upgrade PFSense CE to PFSense Plus with TAC Lite. Uh, when will that happen? If the what will happen as subscription expires, you just roll it back. You can convert. Uh, well, I don't know if you can do in place conversion. I take that back. I know the, the backup files are the same, it doesn't shut off when the subscription expires. Matter of fact, I did break a subscription key playing with it, and I learned that you can just resubscribe. Um, but if you break it, it just doesn't get the package updates anymore it stays working it just doesn't get package updates um so yeah if you're wondering what happens i accidentally broke mine goofing with it and i was i was doing something i don't remember exactly what i did to create that problem <clears throat> how many resources do you assign as an orchestra my backup seems slower than yours on a 10 gig connection and true national storage what makes them slow is going to be the speed of the cpu they're very cpu bound um, so that can definitely cause a problem with your backups not being fast. Also, uh, if you look here at my Delta backups and you notice I'm using transfer data with NBD, I have that turned on. That's, um, something you can read about how to do NBD transfers. They started doing it last year or in January. It's, uh, much, it's much more supported now. And... Uh, it will increase your transfer speeds for backups. But there are still limitations depending on the CPU you have because just by moving Zen Orchestra over to our faster machines compared to the one it was on, my backups got substantially faster. So <clears throat> I don't, you're you're not going to get a night and day performance. You're going to get very small incremental performance. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to corrupt a lot of things and cause more headache than it's worth to use jumbo frames. Jumbo frames can, setting MTU 9000, can add some efficiencies, but 
make sure everything supports it. Um, we've had uh, consulting jobs that people have booked us for where they had corrupted things and goofed things up and we had to ungoof them because that's what they had done was set up a bunch of jumbo frames. I'm trying to move around so I got my, there we go. I have my foot stool that I lean back on. I want it under me. So yeah, jumbo frames are, it's, and maybe I'll do a video on it, but I, I think the speed gain is like 5% or something like that. Uh, the, the headache gain can be higher than that. I would only recommend it probably for your storage network if you're trying to get peak performance out of it. But usually performance on storage networks is different limitations, such as drives. Uh, Jeff from Craft Computing has been discussing this because he's moving things to the 100 gig. You are jumbo frames won't help. He kept running into drive problems, so he's been upgrading everything else. So <laughs> Update on my WAN dropping issue. Yes, it was a real tech. Yes, re people don't you. Don't use real tech. Yes. <clears throat> On Reddit last night, Jim P from NetGate showed off a very brief demo, uh, the app they're using. Very cool. Did he put it on YouTube or where did he put it? I know he said it on Reddit, but like, did he embed it in Reddit under Reddit RPF Sense? So I'd, I'd share that with the class. Let's see. I have to look for, or the bigger question is, did he delete it off of there? Anyways, if you can send a link or post it somewhere, that'd be nice. Uh, is he in here? I'll see if he's posted in a Reddit. Uh, let's see. I don't see anything. I was looking at Jim P's Reddit and see if I could see a post in there. Is it possible to forward external static IPs address? Uh, through UDM Pro to local servers. You can do port forwarding. I don't know if you can do full one-to-one uh, -one NAT. Thanks for all the knowledge uh, you've shared next CPNG next week. We're 80% migrated from Hyper-V and ESSI. Such a great product. Awesome. Friends don't use, friends don't let friends, uh, Realtek or Broadcom. He linked it in Vimeo. All right. Let me see if there's a Vimeo link. Just not seeing it. Hmm. It's all time past week. Hmm. They must have taken it down. I just did a quick search and didn't find it. So, <clears throat> have you got a video on storage networks? If you're in TrueNAS to use multiple IP addresses, um, it's not hard to configure TrueNAS to use multiple IP addresses. So, I guess I'd need more context of your question because uh, multiple IPs on TrueNAS, I mean, just go to network and Add your interfaces. Mine has two different IP addresses. You just add them. So I don't under. Okay, Gonzo Pacho, the other one. All right. I know who that is. So let's see. Did he. There we go. Share this instead. Can we do this? Will it share? Pretty neat. 
So they're working on it. Cool. So they're here they're working on the uh feature there. Remote management thread our netgate sub. Yep. I'll throw a link in here. Uh, and we'll throw the link over here. There. People can go read it. It's on Reddit. Let's uh, see. Cool. All right. Now I've shared all that information in there. <laughs> sharing the knowledge, sharing the knowledge here. Oh, question for all these people in live stream. This is the question I wanted to ask at the beginning. Does anyone know? And if not, I'm going to have to do a little more Googling. Is there any uh, projects that would allow you to take the ubiquity cameras and grab frames out of them for a time-lapse compilation. You can DM me. You can email vlog Thursday at lawrencesystems.com if you know of a project for that. Um, that would be great. Uh, someone asked, and it's a you know large organization. They're trying to <clears throat> document that's going to be a multi-year project building out these buildings they're doing. They have internet access at the buildings. They have, they have ubiquity cameras already um, at the construction site. So they're looking for a time lapse that would extend over years. The time lapse on Ubiquity, as I see, I figured Cody was here. The time lapse on Ubiquity is not something that works the same way like it does. And I'll pull up an example like in Synology. You can be very, very granular. You can take a single snapshot. Um, where is it called? Smart lapse. Like you can say, and this is one of mine, one minute per week. Um, a video. So you can set these up. So you're setting up a, a one minute of video every week of time that goes by and then stretch this out over months of time to be able to do it. I don't think I, I've seen any way to do that inside the Unify. And that's the challenge. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's, it's a cool feature. Um, and you know, it's in Synology, it's pretty, it's slick. So if I filter by one minute per week and it gives me, like we'll go back to when there was snow, probably here. Then you can watch like a whole week of um, video and it condenses it down. Okay, it's one, I should say this one's one minute per day. So this is seven days condensed down to seven minutes. I'm trying to remember when it last snowed, because the snow ones are always cooler to watch the snow come and go. When do we have snow? Oh, there's snow in this one. There we go. We got snow, and then the snow goes away. But nonetheless, it'd be cool if... if uh, if someone knows about that, can message me. That'd be great. If not, I'm going to do some searching for them. Um, it's a little, it's a large organization doing some, they do a lot of charity work. So And does the snow go away? Yeah, there's a snow melting. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Never use real tech for routing. True. Uh, can you briefly describe generally file structure choices at the time of creation for a VM on XCPG versus true to scale? And what is thin versus thick? Um, thin provisioning means I can specify. We'll go over here. So right now, matter of fact, it's kind of easy to tell if we look at the backups. So if we look at the backups, for example, backup testing demo, and if I read it, it only is 15 gigs. So we have 15 gigs used. The 
virtual machine here, the, we'll go over here to the um, disk, or the 60 gig. This is thin provisioned. There's only 15 gigs in use. The storage is thin provisioned, so it doesn't take up because it's only got 34 gig used, even though I've got a 60 gig drive in here. So here is my 60 gig drive. Not, well, that's actually Eric's. Where's the other one? This one's got a couple snapshots, but thin provision means only use the storage you're actually using. Don't provision all of it. So that's thin provisioning. And if you store it on NFS, it's still thin provision. It's going to be the size of the file um, in use, not the entire size of the potential of the drive. So thin provisioning is um, generally speaking the way you want to go. I would set up a Synology to view RTSP streams of the Unified camera. The time lapse would be easy, but Unified Protect program was crap compared to Unified. Yeah. So that's probably... Oh, neat. So uh, the LTS Synology is now upgraded. So from the beginning of this blog to the now times, we'll go over here. Five. We have now... Travis has now initiated an upgrade, so let me log into it, and we'll share it. We can look at the new 7.2. I don't even know what the new features are for it. Good news is it's healthy. Oh, and it's got package updates. No, oh, this package is no longer supported. So let's see what we broke. <laughs> Everything says beta. But it works. It's here. I'll look at it later to figure out what's actually new about it. But I know we're on the latest release. Let's look at the release notes. <clears throat> That'll tell us why we should care. Or not. All versions. Where's the 7.0? Oh. I guess I'd have to find the 7.2 release notes. Yeah, whatever. We'll figure that out. That's a later. That is a later problem now. Full volume encryption. Container image package. Okay. I hate when you find predict you can't specify or have what choice to specify your own SRD servers if you want, unless I'm missing something. I don't think you're missing anything. I don't think that's a feature. Uh, it's been a while since I looked at Blue Iris. I think it has a timeless function. We'll read RTPS, RTSP. Hmm. <clears throat> I guess that's an interesting way to look at it because if I were to go into our Synology with Surveillance Station... <clears throat> and we wanted to add a camera and we added a camera manually. I'm assuming, I'll just double check. Did they ever add? No, they didn't add Unify. We user define it and we just point it at a RTSP path. You're right, that might work. <clears throat> that could be an interesting way to do it. I'll test that um, because we have this Synology. I'll see if this can pull time lapses for our Synology. That would be a really clever use. I don't know. I'll have to play around with that. Anyone in my office is paying attention and wants to poke at this. <laughs> That's an interesting thing to uh, poke at. Okay, cool. Travis has got a link for me here. Oh, man. Wrong button. It won't let me click it. Where did... I got to go somewhere else to click that. Yeah, if someone wants to give that a try at the office, um, I'm curious if you could pull the RTSP from our current cameras into here and then turn on a time lapse. This would be interesting because they have multiple construction sites and they could then pull from multiple construction sites into one Synology to do all of this. That would be interesting. Oh, <laughs> what am I doing? Uh, I'll message you later, but basically the idea is 
pulling RTMSP streams from unified cameras into uh, Synology as a time lapse. It's called smart lapse inside of Synology. So that's something to play with. That would be interesting if it worked. It'd be a solution for the client question. Let's go ahead and click that link Travis sent me. I can't click things when I'm using StreamYard. It doesn't let me click. All right, here's the DSM 7.2. Uh, oh, cool. Some tamper-proofness. New immutable snapshots. Neat. Encrypt entire drives. So... Uh, block level full system backups. Okay. I'm all for this being faster. Adaptive login, new defense, transparent management. Neat. Improved user experience. Hmm. I don't know why they renamed it, but whatever. Is this out for release now or? Okay, it still says, it's still got the beta tag on it. Be aware that the is uh, messed up and you have to remove the S and N to make it work. Okay. So... You're watching in real time <laughs> an idea come together that might turn into something or not. Guys, it's commercial. What's commercial? Well, let's find out something else about unified cameras. I'm going to message you separately. You may want to look into this later. Huh? Yeah, it's it's a weird task that the person needs, but um, yeah, just throw it throw it in our uh, our Slack message and go from there. Um, bum, bum, bum. all right, back over to here. Uh, I am laughing at how many views uh, the video about firewalls is getting. So that that video turned out to be better than I expected, comparing firewalls, and it's made more and more people angry. Um, that the number of people that have um, lots of strong opinions on firewalls has been amusing to me. I've also learned the part you can't really do well is in, in a video like that, because you just sound like you're ranting, but you are. Um, I realized that the documentation for, and this is coming from 48 partners themselves, people that reached out to me that are IT friends of mine that use 48 uh, and they, their love hate relationship with it is how bad some things are implemented and how bad the documentation is. And it's, that does affect your overall experience. Like their answer is it's not documented, but it does this, or it's not documented well, but if you, if you call support, um, they'll help you configure this thing that isn't documented very well in their feature. And I'm just like, ah, oh, yeah, it is. It makes a lot of sense because I, I one thing a PF sense has going for it versus the other firewalls I had listed tons of not just documentation from netgate but also write-ups all over the internet you can find not just my videos but people who take the time to really do a lot of write-ups and then not just me lots of people who did videos on pfsense and all the fancy features it has um that makes it easier to use you know whether or not you like the interface there's someone with a write-up that tells you how to get something done in there and one nice thing is the interfaces look the same for years. So a write-up from 2017 probably is easy to apply to a 2023 version of PF Sense. It just puts them in a big advantage. Um, it's, yeah, it's kind of a challenge because everyone wants their firewall to be your favorite. And as I said multiple times in that video, I'm not here to tell you what to use. Use what you want. I'm just here to do my videos and talk about things I use. So, yeah. Nonetheless, people were um, people were still salty about it for sure. Lots of salty. 
you know, I'm salty about the stupid search inside of Google. Sometimes it just does not want to pull things up. You're like, you're searching for it and you're like, yeah, I just can't share the thing I wanted to share. <laughs> but I changed a couple things in here, but they're kind of fuzzy. Um, so I'm always, it, it, it's always one of those things. And the reason I say I'm fuzzy is because saying that the, um, the, what do you call it? The 40 gate supports this. I put an asterisk because it's not manageable. <laughs> it, it, it's like if you want to put all the certificates in from the command line, they don't have full UI management for it. But someone did link me to the documentation. And because they don't call it a reverse proxy, I didn't find it searching. But someone sent me a link to the documentation. But then when I seen that they don't have good management for it, I'm like, is it a feature or is it something they crammed in there? I don't know. And matter of fact, this particular person says they are using reverse proxies, but they they found them too hard to manage on their 40 gates. So they use separate software for reverse proxies. They use Nginx because 40 gate was too hard to manage. And yeah, that's the reason they knew about it. If I understood, if I understood the whole conversation, the some of the back and forth, and that was the reason. And I just kind of laughed about it. Ah. Uh. MikroTik also suffers from bad documentation. There's been a lot of debates people had, and apparently like something that works on one model doesn't work on the similar model because of different firmware revisions. There's a couple debates that people got in about this, and I'm just like, you know, I don't know what to say. Like, it's one of those things where if the documentation is not good, and probably the biggest reason people want me to do videos, like the biggest ask tom i can't find out how to make this thing work can you do videos on it to make it work i'm like well i don't have the time to uh poke at it until i figure it out because there's not a document i can read from to make it work so it eh, kind of comes be a headache oh yes 40 gate has had its share of vulnerabilities that is for sure aloha Yeah, lots of vulnerabilities. There is no doubt about that. I've worked with a few firewalls, but I really struggle with Meeker Tick. Yeah, the the Meeker Ticks are just, I mean, there's people who really like them. We know people in the Wisp market, they just sing their praises, but they always have like a team of people or a couple of people that are absolutely been using them for years level expert, which is great. But that those people aren't really documenting very well. How will they use them in configuration recipes and things like that? Um, so that seems to cause some of the problem of figuring them out. So if, you've, if you're someone who figured them out, cool, you can save some money and go Meeker Tick because they're definitely priced very well. But... Um, that comes at the sacrifice of documentation for them. Mikrotix, um, they also seem a little weirdly buggy. I remember when I was just looking through all the Rata updates, they had weird problems that people would run into. Uh, and it was in their firmware updates. Like, good, they're updating it, but that's a weird problem to have. Just, I can't remember all of them, but it was all these little things that, I don't know. I don't know if they're edge cases or not. I just don't use enough Mikrotik to really become an expert on it. And I'm very open to admitting that. Like I'm, people say, well, you, you know, you're dissing on Mikrotik. I'm like, I didn't have my, like my experience using them was not amazing. And most people seem to share that. The only people who seem to like them back to people who, you know, looking for that low budget device. But hey, if you want to use them, I'm not telling you not to. <clears throat> Unrelated to firewalls, but curious what you think. ZFS compression, are there any performance benefits? Not really. The LZ4 compression is really efficient, really efficient. So you're not you're not seeing a performance benefit turning it off. I mean, if your processor is older than 10 years, you may have some, but most people are using processors that are less than 10 years old. Have issues with one of their switches? Management interface seems to disappear. Well, that's fun. Where does it go? What makes it come back? Where, what, does it just vanish and never come back? Or do you have to reboot it? I just laugh. I, there's a, I was trying to find it. There's a, 
a long debate where someone who is a really likes Meeker Tick, they had a long post in my forums to talk about all the firmware versions and the board revisions and some of the weird quirks you run into trying to set something up that won't work on one model, but will work on another model. But the documentation doesn't clearly tell you which ones this configuration will or won't work on. Um, that's, I don't know, but those are some of the problems with these companies in, they can have really brilliant engineers cranking out some great stuff, but if you can't follow it up with good documentation, it's hard to, yeah. What's my opinion on dedupe? Uh, deduplication works fine. Like it, if you need it, it's good. It requires, uh, it, it can be computationally intensive because it works at the block level. So it's comparing all the blocks and determining which blocks can be duplicated. So it's, it's definitely a space saver if you have data that can be deduplicated. It's a waste of time if your data can't be deduplicated. So it depends on the data you're putting on there. Takes a reboot. Even the console cable won't work. Weird. Don't have an answer for that one. But I don't work with many Meeker ticks, so I'm also not someone seeing that problem very often either. I actually don't mind the Switch OS. Um, the Switch OS I found easy enough to use. It's the router OS that I didn't find easy to use. Got a PoE Meeker tick with Switch OS Lite. The firmware it ships with is essentially broken. Now it's running RC firmware from a random forum post, and it's fine, but sheesh. Yeah, that's it. Someone had commented, and the thing that made me laugh the most was when someone said, Maker takes that device, it always requires some secret incantation that you'll probably find in a forum post that no one will tell you why it works, but you copy and paste it because it works. And I just laughed. I think that's the Stack Exchange answer or something, and it really cracked me up. It still functions, so I leave it. Oh, yes. And those are the parts that scare me sometimes. The whole, it still works, so I use it type of answers. Like, that's, yeah. The maintainers of ZFS strongly maintain, advise, no. I've not seen them strongly advising it. They... They want, to, they want people to go in with their eyes open to what it takes to run deduplication. If you do not do that, um, then you are going to have problems. And it's probably one of those support problems that people run into. Like they turn it on on a, they're, they're trying to be budget oriented. They have a budget oriented machine. They turn it on and then they contact support. This don't work right. Um, yeah, that, that old Celeron you dragged out of the closet, <laughs> it's probably not a great idea to run deduplication on it. So it's usually the complaints are more likely to be a support problem, uh, than an actual functional problem with it. I haven't had any functional problems with it when I've tested it, but it's, you know, I know there's, there's penalties of calculating the deduplication blocks. So Oh, uh, let's see. Cool. People are replying to something else I posted. Uh, is there any more people emailing vlog Thursday? Let's look. Nope. Just that last one was about cable modems. Oh, I forgot to put that on there in a banner. There we go. <laughs> Recently had to deal with the 48 F100. And man, what a terrible experience. I'm used to the PF Sense experience. And the 48 is just like a wool ball and at the time to configure it. You know, I was really aggravated with a 48. We were doing a PF Sense setup for a client. They had 48s and we had to get IPsec working. Everything in the error messages inside of PF Sense was telling me it was the 48. 48 support denied. And finally, after doing some digging, on the 48, I found they were using an old version of IP Swan. Uh, I think, yeah, 
something like that. Well, the, the, the IPsec version they were using had some bugs in it. I pointed that out and then they had a, they said, Oh, you're out. You have to buy um, some, I think they made them buy some updated license to get a new version of the firmware, but the firmware fixed it. Um, well, almost first the firmware. And then we learned there was another bug we could trigger where the 48 wouldn't accept IPsec connections anymore. But if you rebooted it, not restarted the service, because according to 48, you just have to restart the service. Oh no, rebooting it, it would connect every time. The PF Sense, we never had to reboot. It just connected. So we had some weird quirkiness with 48. This is a while ago. That was like two years ago. Um, maybe they fixed some of those bugs. I don't know. Interoperability between vendors should be smoother, not always smooth. But most of the time, the recent ones we've set up, my staff has set them up. They've just worked. Um, they worked fairly well. So thank you, Andrew is Nike 4,100 power enough to run n top PNG Sericata, uh, sorted out for a client to introduce a complicated blocking. No, definitely jump up to the 6,100 for that. 4,100 is going to be on the edge of, of a bad experience doing that. So you're probably going to move over to a, uh, 6,100 for that. And uh, thank you again for the donation. It's greatly appreciated. Do you have any idea how to get boot time council messages from Zen Kernel when your machine has no onboard IPMI or built in R security port? Uh, no, never tried. Not something I've needed. Uh, can you do a video on how to set up multiple? Uh, WAN video on how to set, send a machine only through that static WAN IP over the one. Did I do anything wrong? Well, I have a video on policy routing, and I think you mean policy routing. So policy routing is the answer. I did a recent video on policy routing. So uh, that video is the answer. I don't, I don't, if it's not working for you, I don't know what you did wrong. But policy routing is the, uh, what you're looking for. There's documents in PF Sense on it. I did my video based on the documentation inside of PF sets. I asked about multiple IPs and Trinas to the, do they not both register on DNS and cause issues? Do you leave the gateway blank on the storage network? Yes. The gateway does not need to, let me pull this up um, in our production storage network. So you do not um, see storage is going to be this network here. I don't know. Am I confused about something? Hold on. But let me pull that up. I got to have another thought here. Why did I think I had it named as another VLAN? So LTS office. Networks. And maybe I'm just wrong about what I had the VLAN name. Okay. I got it right. Never mind. I'm just confused. I did rename it all. Anyways, you may notice in here that the storage, um, there's the IP address of it, 20.225. But if we edit it, it doesn't need a gateway. Um, that's not needed in here. My storage network doesn't need a gateway or DNS or anything. You don't need those in there to make that work. So hopefully that clears that up. Matter of fact, um, the storage network doesn't even exist in my PF sense because it doesn't need to. There's no purpose for it. Everything on the storage network is a separate, um, separate from other things. Largest one for a client? Um, let me think. Probably. I know we have one client. They mostly set it up, not me, but they had, I think, 300 virtual machines, three or 400. Um, there's another one recently that is 
not quite as high of a count. I mean, I think they probably have 200 virtual machines, but each machine they have has, um, I think, 5, 12 gigs of RAM in it. It's it's a beast. They built some beastly machines uh, across there. We have we have another one, actually. I take it, one of the ones we have um, has three Dell servers with 100 gig connections. So, uh, though, I mean, they spent just in hardware. I think the Dell servers were the like well over a hundred something thousand dollars just for the servers before they started building out everything else. I remember being a pretty big bill. So we've worked with a lot of pretty large installs. Hey, thank you, Andrew, for the donation. <laughs> Brett, the one in Europe. I think the one, in, the one in Europe's big, but the other one in Florida, the one in Florida and the other one, I don't know where they're located. I know they're located in the U.S., um, but the Florida one is the one that's got, I think, the 100 gig interconnects. That one's, that's a beast of one, too. But the ones in Europe are pretty big, too. Thank you, Bruce. Do you have a video advice on setting up a number of APs for home site survey of a 2,700 square home? Seven unified access point. It feels like overkill, but it works, but I could improve it. No, this is the problem. Um, it's besides using the unified design center, which can help put you in the right direction. Uh, when the rubber meets the road, the best way to do it is going to be to place them where you think they'll be and then do a site survey with them on there. The, the problem is the materials on the walls. You can specify that in the unified design center to get you a pretty good idea but it's still not going to be the same as the reality. It'll get you close, but if you want it even better, um, you're going to have to sometimes just place them. And overkill is not bad. This is one of the advantages of having inexpensive access points compared to some of the competitors. We can put more of them in. Honestly, they the, that usually gets you a better experience to have sometimes one per room. Uh, I only have two in my house, and it covers my whole house. My house is about 2,000 square feet. Um, and I have a basement, which is also 2,000 square feet. And I've got one that covers almost all of it. And the way my wife's office is at the front and where the garage is, I put in one, um, what do you call it? Uh, why don't I just pull it up? We'll pull up Tom's house here because I forget the, which ones I have. Yeah, I've got an in-wall HD, the UAP IW HD. Uh, that one covers my garage and my wife's office. And my wife's uh, works from home as well, so she's hard lined in. And then the U6LR uh, covers the rest of my house. U6LRs are awesome. They just work. Spectrum analyzer, make sure you have no overlapping channels. That is important. Um, don't overlap the channels. You can, you know, Ubiquity, if you're in a house and you don't have the neighbor's uh, Wi-Fi bleeding into yours, the auto will do that. The auto can get be problematic if it's fighting with neighbors who are also using automatic uh, and you're playing whack-a-mole, changing things around. So, but yeah, testing... Testing Wi-Fi is always fun. Whenever you can hardline things, that's always my answer. Anything I care about, gaming systems, blah, 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 that's all hardlined. That just makes it a lot easier. Yeah. And, and Cody also did a re... I think Cody has a recent video on using the uh, Wi-Fi Man app to map things. I've been wanting to do a, a map because I was going to talk about how I have it set up on my house. This is, yeah, this is the worst one. Apartment and Wi-Fi are fun, especially because broadband vendor seems to have unusually high power. Well, they don't want people complaining about low power, so they have lots of power, which means that everything's, like, you do a Wi-Fi scan in an apartment, it's always, it's a disaster. It's a disaster of overlapping networks. Oh, uh, let's see. What else did I have here? My backup testing demo stuff. I should have this video done soon. You, you know, I do a lot of the XCP and G videos. It's interesting because they're they're not going to be my most viewed videos. I know a lot of people know me for them um, and things like that. They're always my niche videos. But boy, 
they have us interacting with the biggest companies. Like some of the larger scale projects we've done have come from XCPNG um, and consulting around that because they have us rebuilding quite a few things in a network. So I definitely like doing it. And uh, it's, it's just such a good project too. I'm always, always so happy working with them. <laughs> They've cut the hard line. Ah, yes. Ubiquity wall thing. That's a good way to put it. Uh, let's just pull that up because let's just call it what it is. Ubiquity wall thing. <laughs> like, why Ubiquity? What? Who thought this was a good idea? It's... Oh, I like it. We'll go with this tab here. We see um, the two people have done the videos, Christian Crosstalk and Cody. Um, both did videos on it, but yeah. I don't get it. Like, I, I don't know. I wouldn't buy it. If they sent me one, maybe. But this is a dumb form factor. That's my opinion. I don't know. I've seen there's people who've made it look nice, but I think it's silly. I, I really got nothing else besides silly. Someone will like it. So, positive. Is, is it, I didn't even look. Is it sold out? Nope, in stock. So it's it's in stock. That tells me it's not the most popular thing. <laughs> oh, I didn't get a review video out as I only have the EA version. Okay. It's dumb. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's priced very good either. I don't know. It doesn't have a, for packing everything into one, not to mention if something goes bad, now you've got a giant brick on your wall. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, I started using Tech Supply Direct instead of Server Monkey. Um, we have a relationship with Tech Supply Direct. I have an offer code that gets you a discount. Um, we bought a lot of servers from Tech Supply Direct. We think they're great people. But I don't, we just, we didn't have any bad experiences with Server Monkey though either. It does look like a, a tankless hot water heater. Yeah, it's in stock, so it's not popular. I mean, how else can you describe it? If you want to know if something's popular with Ubiquity, they probably don't have it. If we sorted their site by out of stock, like this here, you you go, oh, okay. Yeah. I, all I sold out. You know why they're sold out? Because these are the popular models. If we go to their cameras, I wonder what cameras are popular. Uh, protect. Sold out, sold out, sold out, sold out. You can't get the doorbells. The doorbell is kind of cool. I mean, it's a neat product. Can't find them, though, because they're always sold out. $79 cameras. Great price. Can't have it. You can you can brag about selling, offering, I should say, one. But you can't brag about selling them because they're not in stock. At least the NVRs are in stock right now. Uh, what are the requirements for 10 gig LAN? I have six home cut secure videos and 10 UV cameras, three Apple TVs, and a bunch of iPhones. Not that. <laughs> UDW, Unified Disappointment Wink. <laughs> uh, Anyone want a 3100? The case is cracked. You can have it, just pay shipping. How'd you crack the case on it? They're not supposed to be standing up to physical abuse. I assisted on install of Amsterdam. I had over 200 com uh, competing SSID's initial scan. Uh, yeah. Uh, does Cass like the glasses? Yes, my wife likes my glasses. Get rid of the Eufy cams. Yeah, Eufy, man. I, I am not surprised, though. 
they're just bad at things like security. Uh, what are your thoughts on running a VM for all that for a decent sized home lab house? Am I dumb overkill for making it private life more work? My work life. It's up to you. I don't do it, but. I don't have a reason to do it. I'm the only one authenticating. No one else uses my home lab stuff but me. So, um, and at, at the office, the I, we just don't have enough people at my office using our lab. So I don't really. It's just not been a thing. I mean, I could use OAuth and single sign-on for like Zen Orchestra, but it's just not a big enough deal to me for. Um, I don't know for any of it really. <laughs> oh, okay. Just the plastics cracked. Switch to Chrome OS. Uh, oh. <laughs> Did I miss MSP GeekCon talk? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Kyle, are you busy? Would you like to come on as a spokesperson for MSP GeekCon? I talked about it in the beginning, but, you know, seeing as you have something to do with it, I can send you a link. You can join the stream. <laughs> you are more than welcome to. What is an MSP GeekCon? It's a place where I'm going to be, so you should be there too. That's what an MSP GeekCon is. <laughs> okay, I can... Because um, I'm getting ready to wind down the stream, but before we do that, let me send Kyle a stream link. Let's see how this goes. We're going to put Kyle... Kyle doesn't do many live streams, so let me um, message him directly on MSP Geek. Uh, where do I usually message you, Kyle? I, I don't have you in my uh, in the DMs here. There we go. Message. Doo, 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 doo. We'll see if Kyle shows up. Will he click the link? <laughs> Uh, have I heard of 45 Drive's new Ransom Protection Solution? Yes, it's something very cool they're working on. Very cool. Um, can't speak much to it right now, but in the future, expect Tom to probably have some opinions on it. But I like where they're going with it. It's definitely, um, I like where 45 Drive's is thinking. Uh, I am trying to figure out how to fish out your email from this Google chat thing. Oh, I, I get what you're doing now. Uh, William Daughtery, thank you very much. Do Daugherty, I, I am probably saying your name wrong. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to put a phonetic way to say your name in there, I'm all for it. <laughs> All right, Kyle has joined us. Hey, I'm here. <laughs> There's only 125 people here, but um, if you want to tell people why they should be at MSP GeekCon, I, I brought it up at the beginning. I think you've probably by now seen the Slack message I posted. Um, I didn't read that. That That's just, I'm going to do a separate video for that. But um, nonetheless, I was just telling people why they should go. It's because it's not vendor driven. And it's got really smart people speaking at it that you guys hand picked. And uh, it's a great place to hang out with all the MSP geek people. I'm going to pull this down. So you already got the date and everything. Everyone knows that. I, I drop links at the very beginning of the video for all that. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, uh, it's everything you mentioned. I mean, we spent a lot of time, effort, uh, in, in a very short period to make this happen. Um, and we we specifically didn't want to completely emulate uh, all the other conferences that exist. Um, MSP Geeks whole mantra is or 
uh, rising tide raises all ships, right? So uh, our goal is to teach technicians something that not any other conference does very well, if at all. Um, and we're trying to focus specifically on that. We handcrafted the topics. So when we were discussing what this would look like, we were like, these are the topics we want to talk about. And this is how they all take, this is how they work together. It's not just a simple, like, we're talking about this. We're talking, they all connect. Uh, we're calling it our infinite journey of learning. Um, and it's just a, an infinite loop. Everything that, that that you do as a technician and as a higher level individual at a company, and these are the things you do. You may not realize it, um, but this is what they do. Um, and then we took and matched up speakers who could speak about those, and we made sure that they could eloquently deliver what we're hoping they can talk about, and that they're experts in what they're what they're demonstrating on. And uh, we have spent. <sighs> Weeks uh, at an already. This is a great <laughs> list of talks, though, um, and 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 the people giving them. So not only the topics, and you know, one of the things I wanted to make sure my audience understood was that this is not because any of us who work in this, we've been to the events that are vendor-driven sales pitches. Is all they are. Um, you know, wine us and dine us. Uh, tell me why your product is the best thing and why I should be using it. These are actually more, you know from technical people, giving technical people how to level yourself up, you know, automation mindset, uh, hacked in 45 minutes with John Strand. Oh, that's, I, that's gonna uh, be exciting. <laughs> I am so nervous about that one. Um, but I am also so excited, uh, cause the, the premise of that is he's going to set up an MSP and then hack it all within 45 minutes, like using, uh, I don't know what, he, what software, like what software he's using to build the MSP, but he's, building an MSP and then hacking into it within 45 minutes. Uh, and I've been to one of his talks. You can find John Strand on, uh, he's done some YouTube videos. I think him and John Hammond did a couple together as well. Mm -hmm. Like he's a, him and John Hammond, both are top notch presenters. So is Kyle Hansevan and all the other people you pick, uh, but their hacking stuff is just so much fun because it's always eye opening, and you're like, ah, I didn't think you could do that. <laughs> so, like, I don't think I've ever, like, you, you don't say that once during the talk. It's like the first 10 minutes in, you start saying that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Anonymous asked a question. Uh, it's on site only. Um, yeah. We are going to do our best to record all of the sessions and put them up uh, at some point. That is our goal. Um, we did not have, like, I don't think anyone, like, we started planning this in the middle of August. That is, yeah. that is from August until today is, like, the timeline for this uh thing when most people have a year or multiple years um so the people involved have been super helpful the sponsors have been super helpful and uh it is uh we, we even have things that are fun like because we're all techies nerdy geeky right we have uh huntress has a special event that's happening sunday evening and the uh after the welcome reception uh we have a DD &D game night uh on monday night so if you want to play DD &D, uh we have some uh dms that are going to be running some games so if you're interested or new you're welcome to come join uh we have the we have a game room that's open 24 7 almost uh and you can go and just grab a board game and go play and once we're done with the event we're going to donate them to uh a, a boys home in and macon and I, I think this is cool because i feel like you've got this intersection um that is between the uh, hacking world, which are generally kind of fun conferences. If you've been to some of the hacking style conferences, GERCON, DEF CON, et cetera, um, and the business conferences, you you got this cool middle of the road one where I, I think that's really important because it's more, it's representing the blue team, which is a lot of what we are because the, the hacking conferences are really focused on the red team. And I know red team gets people excited. Let's go hack some stuff. But the defense side is actually what you end up in. And there's more jobs for what you're likely to do in the industry is be a sysadmin whose task is keeping firewalls and windows servers patched and then, exactly. and then dealing with the fallout because they don't patch. Or that <laughs> then, one user just still clicked on that link, even though it said, don't click the link eight times in eight different spots. Yep. And then we have to go clean it all up. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, this is the first year they're doing it. So we're going to see how it goes. Um, maybe next year it'll be, it, there'll be some virtual option, but that, that would add so much more to the planning that it's not like the fact that you guys are going to be able to try to record this is, is I already know how hard of a task that is. I've been at conferences that have really attempted to record all those shows and it's not easy. So, 
Yeah. Um, we've spent a lot of work and a lot of hours. Uh, the team has, not just me. I'm not that there's 22, 23 people involved in helping getting this set up. Um, we have uh, people, I don't know if you're familiar with, we have Jason Slagle, who's helping us um, yep. multiple times. Uh, Ray Orsini uh, is, is helping us. Uh, Becky from Huntress, is, uh, who has experience in conference, has given us a lot of help. Um, Kelvin. Uh, yeah, Kelvin. It's huge. Uh, there's just Bindi Green, obviously, in the admin team. Um, Mindy's actually in charge of our education. Him and I have worked closely to make sure that uh, what he feels we need to have is delivered effectively. Um, and that's been fun and torturous, trying to <laughs> align the vision of what we're trying to do with who can speak and how we can speak. Uh, you know, it's 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 been fun. I'm not letting my sales guy go, Brett. He can't come. I told him no already. Uh, I'm gonna I bring. I gotta bring technical people. I'm leaving the sales guys at home. <laughs> Smart. I mean, I mean, I'm sure Brett could learn something. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not the way we're we're teaching core skills, which is uh, yeah. The, I think the the important part. We're we not teaching. How, my, no, no, I guess we could level up a sales guy. We could, <laughs> um, but we're teaching core skills. We're not teaching. Um, like we're not telling you how to go into reg regedit and alter a path to a file. Right. Mm -hmm. We're teaching you how to think. How to you know how to operate in in the MSP and tech sysadmin world on a day to day basis? How to how to defend what you're what you're about to do and how to when you solve problems? Um, so it's it's uh it's, it's yeah it's a lot. <laughs> and and by the way, for those you know, MSP Geek Con MSP Geek is a, is its own thing. If you're interested in joining, if you work in the IT and MSP space, that's something. Um, you could just go to, I should pull up the website, right? <laughs> I mean, you could, uh, we're a free community of managed service providers and vendors. Um, we're over 10,000 members between discord and Slack. So yeah, only, there's only 10,000 people. So you feel free to join. It's just, MSP, just a couple of people. Uh, we were work. actually reviewing our, uh, so we're, we're having things done at the conference that allows us to, that we wanted to put our history on, right? So we were going through our history, uh, which has been very fun. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're putting more stuff on the site. They got swag. But I, yeah, 18,000 plus members. <laughs> There's some numbers on there. So if you can't make it to the conference, you can join. And I'll just throw uh, this down there for those of you that you know, want to want to be involved in a community of uh, other geeks. That's definitely... Um, something you can do there's no cost i i am in there randomly people i usually i i, I have trouble real-time chat i'm a forums guy so i'm i'm on the other side of it but i if you tag me i do reply because i do talk to a lot of people in there i'm always the person that gets tagged in pf sensing unified questions so <laughs> yeah that's fair um we I, have a forum too it's not as popular probably as yours but uh we focus on the real-time chat aspect yeah hey it it's value. I certainly, I, I'm a lurker more than anything else. I actually read a lot more in there. I know what's going on because I spend time reading in there. And sometimes I read in the vendor ones because I just want to see what's going on with that vendor. <laughs> so no, I'm with you. Um, hands down the best place. If there's drama going on with the vendor, you'll just, see it. <laughs> just, it's, uh, eat the popcorn, watch the channel. <laughs> yeah. Start selling pitchforks. Um, that too. Yeah. We have the, the, honestly, there's some vendors who take that very well and some vendors who don't. Uh, right. And, we have, like his website said, like over 50 vendors present in the community. It's cool. It's honestly, it's cool for them to just come and interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis. It's awesome. Yeah. It's kind of a nice way. It's, um, it's sometimes a good support method for some of the vendors because you just go okay. in there and have, because you have a question. It's not exactly the ticket. You're like, man, I just want to know if this parameter will work. I have this idea. And sometimes you end up with one of the engineers replying and going, yeah, you can do that. Just, uh, do this or add this parameter and you can deploy it this way. And you're like, oh, cool. So <laughs> uh, actually runs their support out of our community. It is the weirdest thing to see. Who does that? Uh, Emmybot. Oh, Emmy Bot. Yeah. He's in I, I like him. He is, you know, what reminds me is that is he talks so fast. <laughs> it, lightning. It is great. Um, because I signed we signed up for my MSP signed up for Emmybot and I got uh the welcome email and it said if you'd like to support, go to mspgeek.com and or, or dot org and join the channel Emmybot. And I was just like <gasps> it completely caught me by surprise. And if you haven't heard of Emmybot, I'm just gonna say check it out. Uh it's actually really slick. It is so. Yeah, it's definitely. Um, I'll throw I'll throw a link in chat for people who, who the, might be. Their website's in. changed. It's been. It, it looks way better than it did. 
So props on whoever did that. Um, I yeah, they had a, I had some conversation with them. They build um, automation installers for everything. Like it's crazy how how good uh, for nine hundred applications. And he flat out calls himself out Emmybot versus Intune. He's doing better than Microsoft. <laughs> there's there's a reason you didn't say, oh, we just use Intune for everything because yeah. Emmybot can do things Intune can't. <laughs> yeah. Um, honestly, the stuff he's done with PowerShell is uh, scary. Yeah. Um, I'm just happy he's playing for the good side because those techniques and the skill sets they've got over there, uh, because they have got, they've got to be able to deploy software and they got to be able to do it efficiently, uh, and keep track of versioning and whatnot. And then just, Oh, it's great. Yeah. How Emmy removes setups and like that. Like I said, it's really, um, Darren's outstanding at, uh, the integrations you've done, but if you work doing any type of automation on, on the Windows side of the house, you know, I all talked on my channel a lot about Ansible and things on the Linux side, but this just doesn't exist very well on the Windows side before Emmybot. It, it was uh, Emmybot's probably one of the best things I've seen out there. I know Microsoft's got their own installers they're working on, but back to uh, like there's a reason he's comparing himself to Intune and things like yeah. that. <laughs> Microsoft's not been great about it, but this is where I wanted to wind it down. So thank you for uh, taking the time to join in. When I click end stream, go ahead and stay for a couple minutes because we can chat still. Um, awesome. But uh, nonetheless, thank you everyone who joined. Click the like button and all that fun stuff and uh, check out MSP Geek. You can join that or hopefully you're going to come to MSP Geek Con. As I, I'm looking forward to hanging out with a lot of people. I've had people message me say they're going Awesome. I like seeing a lot of you there. Get to meet people in person. And uh, I'll see you guys. Maybe if I do a live stream over the weekend. If not, next Thursday is my next one. Later. And that will.